warfare and other things. It's, it's a type of struggle. It's not against flesh and blood, but against the bullets, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Verse 13. Therefore, put on the whole armor of Christ, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand in them. So what Paul wants Christians to know is to stand. Yeah. If you are not able to stand on your ground, on what Christ has done for you, Satan will continue to deceive you. You may be able to stand your ground and then continue. And after you've done everything, to stand in them. So the word stand is very important to you. If you continue, verse 14, stand fair. So if you are not able to stand, the devil will only deceive you. I research into witchcraft, sorcery, and spiritual issues. And I interview those people who claim to have uh, been exercised from demon possession and witchcraft. And also uh, interview practicing sorcerers and practicing uh, uh, witch, witches, those people who claim. And I, I'll tell you one of the stories that I encountered. When I visited this man who said that he was a wizard, and was proud of his witchcraft. You know, I started interviewing him, and the man was speaking boldly, as if he did not fear anything. So I was quite worried, and I said, what do witches fear? And this man said, we fear nothing. And I said, we Christians believe that we fear God, and I said, let me bring in Jesus. And Jesus, then he claimed, smiled, I said, oh, it is only those who, whose power are minimal, the witches whose power are minimal. They are afraid of God or Christ. And I said, this man can do this before me. So I looked straight to the face. And then the man fell back on his seat. And then for a moment, he came back and breathed a sigh of relief. Mm. And he said, very man. In other words, man, let us leave it here. That's all right. I've got one question. He said, I've told you everything. Everything I know. I've told you everything. I said, just a question. He said, please, I've told you everything. I said, after this question, I won't ask him anything. It's all right. Carry on. I said, if I need part of your witchcraft, will you give it to me? Oh, he said, yes. And I said, what will you do? You get me on blah, 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 blah. Then I said, but don't you know that I have got much more power than you? <clears throat> this man now stood up, bowed before me. He said, my Lord, I know. Yeah. And then he turned to a young man who brought me to him. He was living in the northern part of Ghana. I was in the southern part of that time. I had to travel again through a young man. And then he turned to the young man, my grandson, fear this man, because God is with him. Praise God. Now listen, you see, this man was speaking as if he did not fear anything. And even when I asked him that, will you give me part of your power? He said yes. But then when I asked him, don't you know that I have much more power than you? He then said yes. So if I did not know my staff, no. you would have deceived me. And this is what many Christians are full of. They don't know That's what right. Christ has done for them. Right. So if you are a Christian, you don't have anything to do with Shama, with uh, witchcraft, and how do you call them here? Scambo. You don't have anything to do with these things at all. Once you know your staff, they will bow down before you. May God have mercy on us. So, as he said, if somebody has not acknowledged Jesus as his Lord and business in him, you don't need to go and say, I'm going and casting out the Holy Spirit from you. You don't need to do that. If somebody would have to accept Jesus, acknowledge him. If the person acknowledges Jesus, then you've got a stand to pray for that person and deliver the person. Otherwise, you will be pouring water on the stone. You know, Paul met this woman always 
and he never did that until the spirit revealed to him when he realized that he was giving something to deceive others, that he was having a life spirit. It was there that Paul had to come in to reveal the familiar spirit. So we take another set of questions. Yes, sir. Um, all right, let us take some from here. I'd like to see that you, you raise up your hands for a very long time. And, and I mean, if you look at Martin Luther, 
what he said was criticized by the then church. And when you look at even the one that we speak about a lot, Mr. Seymour, so he was criticized by Christians. So it's easy for us to fall into the same trap of criticizing people that are revealing something that is in scripture as well. So, so, but I found the second presentation to be a bit more helpful to say, let's, let's name it properly. Let's say that there are certain practices that are wrong and unscriptural, and when he mentioned them, I could agree in my spirit. Yeah, that, that one is wrong. And then he mentioned, he also acknowledged the things that are positive. Because these guys are very innovative. And as a businessman, you know you need innovation. There's social media, there's digitization, there are many things that can make you irrelevant. And there are Pentecostal churches that are being made irrelevant because they don't deal with the issues that people have. And so these churches, in a sense, you may argue that they they saved Christianity in some ways because maybe Christianity could have been ripped back um, or would be made irrelevant uh, because it's not dealing with uh, real issues. Maybe a lot of people will be going into ancestral worship or whatsoever. So I think we need to be a bit more nuanced in these issues. Um, to, to, to criticize one help us, one way to solve the problem. All right, thank you very much. We will try to respond to this one before. <coughs> Thank you. Would you like to respond to that? It is very true. Uh, maybe. It is very true that um, pastors, the pastors of today, don't know how to deal with the spirit world. Right. It's because um, our mentors are Western trained. Right? Um, when the gospel came to Africa, um, they preached the gospel, missionaries preached the gospel. Thank God for it. spirit world they left. Right? They left completely because they did not know they did not know how to deal with it. I think in, in my book I deal with that there was there was one young man who went to a missionary and said to him, you know what? Um I've got I've got I'm dominated by demons and uh, by spirits at night. And the missionary said, no, you know what? Go back home when you meet a little bit of education, a little bit of the Bible, you will be okay. And then the young man went, went home. And uh, he was studying the New Testament. And he came back to the missionary and said, you know what? I'm still dominated by the spirit at night. And the missionary said, no, 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 you will be fine. The third time, he said, I, I think that we're serving two gods. This young man had come to read uh, Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4. And he said, your God is afraid of spirits. But the God I'm reading about in the Bible is not afraid. That's right. Of the spirit world. In other words, I'm saying, it's good. Theology is good. Um, um, it's good theology, you know, study it, whatever. But when theology leaves out the spirit world, then it's not complete, especially in Africa. Amen. Yes. You know, it, therefore there is a need of, uh, of us studying the spirit world and the moment we know about the spirit world, is there that we can we can get engaged in these things, right? That the reason why guys, I mean, I mean people go to Isangoma and, 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 and traditional healers, is because those people have got knowledge, and the church doesn't have knowledge. Now it's very very important that we start at our theological institution and begin to talk about these things. Okay? 
And then, um, and then we also write about about these things. It's very very important. I'm I'm actually impressed by your by your by your 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 your, your, your testimony. Um, that you know, you know these things. You're a white person, but you know them. That these things are there. Okay. If I can assist you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. First of all, Mark. Mike. There is love in you, I can see it here. I was on a let's see one. See one, one. There you are. I grew up in a proper Afrikaans house. I hated English people. I hated black people. When I got saved, God used me amongst them and I loved them with all my heart. If you love every single convert from your church, you will disciple them with that love. That love will force you to count the cost of your life. I've counted the cost. My father disinherited me. They, my, the white people throw me away. I had no friends left. Me and my wife was just like that. When I come in Kwazulu with the black people, you know what they did to me? They split me and say in my own language, food sack, but one. You know what helped me? Love. Love. If you love someone, you will disciple him. You will not wait for the constitutions. You will not wait for the church. You will not wait for the universities. You will not wait for a weekend. You will wait on the love of God and say, let me walk with you. They only repented at that Makaba Lady. He went home. Every black home, I can say, or Zulu home, in the traditional places where we reach out, have a government in the house. And that government comes from the Matlosi. And that Matlosi is helped by the medium worship water spirits, Nkwati, Nchimulos, Mandau, Sporyan, Fufinyan, Ni, Zonkelentuma. When he reached his home, his mother chased him out. We loved him, me and my wife took him in the house. We trained him. We trained him the practical things first. To disciple someone, you as a pastor, don't look at us. Face Jesus. And face that brother that was converted. Wash in the precious blood of Jesus. And say, let me walk with you. You know, when I took people, it was long before the party, that, uh, or, or 1994, that God delivered me from all this rubbish of hatred. Long before. My best friends are Zulu people. I took baby in my house. Many other people only mentioned baby because his mom was a Samboma. She chucked him out. We took him in. We walked with him. We walked with him. I think he's not answering the question. No. 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 What I'm sorry, my brother. Lord, I ask you, she need to, that love that she had, she must go to the university. Thank you. We've told, we've trained people that we told them that today. How to do the things, how to pray for the sick. All the practical things before we say to the Bible. Let me just respond to a few more of the questions. Um, one of us would want to know how we can identify um, false prophets and teachers. I think that the major identification we need, which he himself mentioned, is the word. Because the word is the, is the only text that can show you what authentic and non authentic prophetism and spirituality is. Yeah. Then number two, you yourself 
should be grounded in the Holy Spirit. I have personally encountered a lot of false prophets, probably God directs some of them to me because of what I do. Let me just share one simple thing. I went for a party and I sat at the table with another man of God. We were all pastors. And he was like, young man, are you a man of God? And I said, yes, please. And he said, God is revealing your ministry to me. And he began to give me very wonderful prophecies. They were things that every human being would like. Your ministry will grow. You travel abroad. You know in Africa, especially in Ghana, when you tell somebody you travel abroad, it's a good prophecy. And the moment they started speaking, then the Holy Spirit ministered to me that this man is a false prophet. Watch him carefully. As at this time, he has never made any error that could even contradict the Bible. But the Spirit in me spoke to me. So that is very important as well. Then as he went further, I started praying and telling God that I want to help this man. So let him bring something that I can use to help him. Then fortunately for me, when he finished, he gave me spiritual direction as to what I should do for the things he told me to happen. Because of time, I won't tell you all the things. But one of the things he mentioned is that he mentioned a place in, uh, in Ghana. They call it this table. He said I should go to a table and do a very big crusade in March of the following year. This is December. When I returned from that crusade, I should go and prepare my passport and just be waiting when the opportunities come. The first continent I'll be going to is Asia. From Asia, I'll go to Europe. From Europe, I'll go to America. Meanwhile, while he was speaking, I just returned from Europe. <laughs> so it was a good opportunity for me to help him. The moment he finished, I said, Madam God, thank you. But if this is how you give prophecies to your church members, then be very careful about it. Because if God were speaking to you, God would know that I don't need to go and prepare a passport. Because I have my passport, which has business in it already. Now, all these things you have outlined, if a young pastor who is ambitious of traveling hears this, he will begin to follow your so called spiritual direction and you will be leading the person into trouble. So, one, the word of God. Two, the Holy Spirit in you. Now, in the, new, in the Old Testament, when you want spiritual direction, you have to do for the man of God, for the prophet. So you keep hearing, is there no prophet of God in this town? But in the New Testament, he has spoken to the Son. Now before the prophet speaks to you, he comes to confirm or contradict the Spirit of God is telling you. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the Son. So we have to, we have to teach our church members also that they have to hear the voice of God for themselves. Jesus told the disciples that when you pray, say, Ah, Father. Mm. I was thinking, because Jesus came from heaven, he would have said, Say, the Father of Jesus. He said, Ah, Father. God is the Father of Jesus. Is my Father is your Father. God is my God. Every member of the church should have God as their personal God. The God should not be the God of the pastor, or the God of the prophet, who will now visit them. God should be their personal God. Then they can count it. So I think that the major responsibility is what Amanda is saying is lying on us to raise our ministers and our church members. When you read Ephesians chapter 4, maybe, okay, I won't read it. Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11, where he's talking about God giving us apostles, prophets, evangelists. Now, if you read the New Living Translation, it says their responsibility is to equip. God's people, so that God's people will build the body of Christ. Amen. And when you continue to verse 16, it tells you that when we build the people to come to that maturity, yes. they will no longer be touched yes. by all kinds of teachings. Yes. So clever they sound like the truth. When, when I hear that, <laughs> then it tells you that the teachings that people are giving are so clever. So it's very important. In Ghana, let me just mention this. There is a model that um, our leader has developed, which we teach in the Bible school. We teach all pastors this course before you even start your ministry. And because I'm speaking today like this because I've been doing Let me give this example. Um, when I was growing up in my ministry, I was a church leader. I was an elder in the same church. I had not yet come to Bible school. 
I was doing deliverance, all right, I had the Holy Spirit in me. Some of these people are doing some of the things out of ignorance. Out of ignorance, some of the things I do in my deliverance ministry is to invite my church members to write the names of their enemies on a piece of paper, we will put into an envelope, add money to it. Then when they come to church, we take off the money and put in the offering book. That one is for God. And the names that are written on the pieces of papers, we pick out those names, take them outside with my presbytery, and then we set physical fire into it. First, we pray that the Holy Spirit should burn those enemies. But the surprising thing is that the enemies whose names are written on the pieces of papers are real human beings. And the surprising thing is that somebody is in that church room. Another person has written his name. Today, as I stand here, I still need deliverance. I still cast out demons. And I won't write names. I don't even pray for my enemies to die. I have now understood the scriptures yeah. and I know how the children should be done. So I think the key here is teaching. If we can teach people to, to be able to catch the fire, but that fire should be guided by the word of God. Then I'm going to So let me just mention this quick one. There are two books that I would recommend uh, that he wrote. One of them is Ritual Warfare. Unfortunately, we didn't bring any of this. Oh, wow. But I'll give you my contact. We can talk and see if there is a way we can get something. However, you can check on Amazon. I think you can get Ritual Warfare by Opoku Onina. Ritual Warfare by Opoku Onina. The second one is Pentecostal Exorcism. In fact, that one even goes to the extent that when you meet somebody who says, I'm a witch, I drink blood, I eat people's flesh. To tell you what to do as a pastor to deal with such a problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, somebody brought one. Yeah, so your question is trained. Uh, I wish all African pastors could be trained in a subject which the monologue because it's very, very, very important. All right, thank you very much. Let me interrupt with some of the things. Um, can a Christian be demon possessed? <laughs> Somebody asked that question. Yeah. I wish I had time. There are differences between witchcraft and demon possession. Uh, there are differences. And if you don't have time to explain it, especially that concept of witchcraft, people don't understand it well. Witchcraft is supposed to be a latent power within. Something that is within the person. It doesn't come from an external force. Any spirit entity from outside your body. But demon possession is supposed to be a spirit entity that inhabits a person. And that spirit can go. You can cast the spirit out and the spirit can leave that person. That is why Jesus says that if a spirit goes, it goes and wanders many places, and if it comes to find out and realize that the place is empty, it comes back. That is demon possession. But if you come to Galatians 5, when Jesus was, uh, Paul was talking about the works of the flesh, you realize that witchcraft was mentioned. Witchcraft was mentioned here. When we come to the Gospels, the term witchcraft is not mentioned. But many people associate demon possession with witchcraft. But they are supposed to be two different things. And that is why many people are confused about it. When it comes to witchcraft, you are supposed to overcome it by walking in the spirit. Um, and this is quite dangerous. In other words, a Christian can still be a witch. A witch. <laughs> <laughs> but not deep. Um, that is why I've separated the two. And I said you need time to understand. If Galatians is saying that walk in the spirit so that you do not overcome the acts of the flesh, the deeds of the flesh. And then he acts witchcraft as one of the deeds. 
That means you need to overcome that aspect of witchcraft. But it needs time to explain it. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'll get more confused. Uh, but I pray that you will not get confused. But if somebody is demon possessed and you, a Christian can easily cast out uh, any demon uh, possessed or any person who is possessed by a demon or with a demon. Once you have the Spirit of God in you, and because like Christian baptized in the Holy Spirit, you should be able to cast demons out. Uh, that is the, the issue. And then, when somebody asks about that false prophets and how people are following them, you see, our concept of, of miracle is sometimes wrong. You know, sometimes we believe that if you go to the Bible during the time of the apostles, Paul and Peter, any disease that they prayed for was healed. But that is not true. If you examine Paul, Peter, you can count the number of miracles that they did. Even Paul, apart from the general one, uh, Peter, they were working around and many people were healed. But you can count the rest. Paul, when it comes to uh, the cripple that he healed, uh, Eutychus who fell from the, the story building, then uh, uh, this man who was uh, by Jesus, that he commanded and he became blind, uh, and then what again? You realize that they are limited. Then he went to Ephesus, he used his apron, it healed people. Otherwise, he was with Timothy. Timothy was sick. Mm. And he said, because of your stomach illness, take some little wine. <laughs> he was working with Trophimus. He was ill. And he was doing missions work with Trophimus. He left him at Miletus, sick, and then he continued. So, so you realize that they could not do anything that they wanted to do. Maybe sometimes if you have such a big crusade and you see evangelists uh, praying for people, you thought that anything that they prayed for, no. It is still Jesus who heals. We pray. And if you pray and he wants to heal, he heals. So healing really takes place at the sovereign will of God. Amen. And once we miss that one, we may have a very wrong concept. So most of the things that people are doing are not real. Some of the false or charlatans, those who have come into the system. Our first aspect goes that continue to pray for the sick. Continue to pray and allow the spirit to manifest himself within the church center. But no matter what you do, still some people will believe that we are doing enough. With Jesus, even Philip said that Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. It means even as Jesus was with them, they were not satisfied. <laughs> Show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. They were not satisfied. <laughs> and with Paul and all those people, people were not accepting Paul, despite all the miracles that he had been doing. So don't think that all the people believe you because of the miracles. Even Jesus, because of the miracles, some people even wanted to kill. So let us continue to teach our members to be grounded in the faith. Miracles can take place whenever God wants it to take place. If we pray. God bless you. So other questions. We will try to close at 4.35. All right. So you can pick a question. Thank you. Um, my my question pertains to if men of God don't understand the way of the Spirit and we tend to criticize and use our pulpits to actually mention names of other pastors and telling your congregation not to go to this one and this one, are we not acting against the will of God? Because I think we should teach the word, the truth, and not use our pulpits to criticize what we don't understand. Because what I'm also observing is that many of us, like I think somebody mentioned that 
from generation to generation. And oh, and the and our honorable pastor also talked about it. That is been there. Criticism, false prophets have been there. And each generation has had these problems. So it is I, I would say it's not wise for us to use our pulpits to say, don't go to this one, that's a false prophet. But to actually teach the truth. Because we do not know what we're actually doing. We could even be touching the God's anointed, we don't know. And then, sorry. The, the, before, point, the point is taken. Yeah, the second one is, I believe demons are international. They are not just in Africa. <laughs> I have seen, yeah, they are not just in Africa. I have seen people being delivered from all over the world. And I have seen teachers coming from generation to generation, teaching even in America, in the UK, and they've been criticized for teaching about deliverance. So it's not me. And lastly, we should know the truth that Satan loves division. And when we divide our very people, and we pastors are divided against each other, instead of actually helping each other and correcting one another, the devil will play around with us. We are sowing the seed of division and it will come to us. Thank you, God bless you. All right, thank you. Um, all right, another lady. Now, make your questions very short. Straight. If you spend more than two minutes, I'll break you. So, question. Uh, I just want to ask you guys to assist with the use of how to use the anointing oil. The reason why I'm saying this, uh, yesterday we were all in the service when uh, a pandemic anointed the people. And um, uh, we know it would be kind of the Old Testament to, 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 to anoint the king, priests, and prophets. James also uh, teaches about when somebody is sick. The, the challenge that I, we have most is in South Africa because these new prophetic uh, churches by using, misusing anointing oil for everything. There's anointing oil for healing, for marriage, for whatever. Also, I mean, also the question is spectral, my question is, can you advise us how to, to teach? I mean, if uh, the Holy Spirit decides to use anointing oil, how am I supposed to use it? In front of my members who are not well well taught or informed, they might think that I'm applying the same practices. All right, one here. We are talking here. But the people here are not answered the subject. Thank you. Um, uh, Apostle Chapoy made us aware some of the things that we have to do and then someone has also uh, handles on those points. One, treatment. The agency of treating our ministers. The second one is intentional discipleship. I will humbly contribute by saying that the battle starts with us. And so each of us here must resolve as we go back to our villages and communities to go and bring a change by adding to what you said, well, our services must be spirit inspired. Amen. So when the members come and in our worship and in our teachings, the Holy Spirit is at work, they will be delivered. And the Holy Spirit will attract others into our services. This is what I really want to add. The second one I want to add is that we need to change our paradigm, our motive for ministry. What is driving us of becoming ministers? We are preparing people for heaven. And the minister should be a watchman of the souls of people. But keeping them the way of God and helping them to grow spiritually. Thank you. All right. Um, all right. Let, let you ask and then we try to respond. After that, we are your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to try to make it short. I want to bring the question on commercialization of the gospel. How can we actually help the church to, to strike the balance or to draw the line? Because there are so many problems around the question of commercialization of the gospel. Even pastors sometimes 
we hear that they do what they call uh, one-on-one sessions, like doctor consultation. Let me start from the issue of we criticizing prophets and deliverance ministers. I think that it's very important for us to know that we are all somebody's servant. Only our master who can judge us. Amen. But it's also important for us to know that when there are false doctrines, the church needs to deal with them. There is a need for us to know the balance between church and church and false teachers. These are very critical issues that we always need to be engaged in so that we don't just sit down because when the truth is quiet, false truth will not go back. We need empowerment, leadership of the church the 21st century in Africa needs empowerment. I think our focus is on Africa for two reasons. One, this conference is in Africa. Two, I have mentioned earlier on that missionaries have observed that the center of Christian vitality has shifted to Africa. So I agree with my sister that demon, demonic issues are not only in Africa. But I think that our focus for this conference, that is why it looks like we are mentioning Africa and Africa. So we will need to know that Every man of God has a master, and we cannot judge somebody's master. But as for the fall doctrine, it's a point for critically that was preoccupation fighting against false prophets. So we will need to identify it. Yeah, and, and that's why, because I don't want to repeat it. And you see, Paul even was mentioning it. I'm a new. He did it. He mentioned the name. Then if you come to uh, Revelation, two names were mentioned. Revelations chapter 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. So if the, the man of God should know his Bible, mm -hmm. the man of God or uh, uh, any woman of God, you should know your Bible and you should be able to instruct and direct your people. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, they will overcome us. And uh, Paul was talking of super spiritual people. Mm -hmm. Those people are even claiming to be super spiritual more than God. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. With all things, and um, as we have all been saying from the beginning of the service, and I think um, one of our um, prophets also mentioned, one of the things that is critical for us is how to get our members to connect to God. Now, people say that when you are teaching in church, members don't like it. I have tried it in my ministry, and I don't think that accusation of our church members is true. It's not true that when you are teaching them, they won't come. What is important is that you cannot walk on one leg. If you teach and you don't lead them in prayer, it's just like trying to walk with one leg. Thank you. It's just like somebody who is praying and refusing to teach. You also want to on another leg. If you want the members to grow, just pray and teach. You are walking. And walking becomes very easy when you are using your two legs. And so Christianity is so simple. It's a word and prayer. The two must go hand in hand. We want to check for the two. Now, the use of anointing oil. I think that you have mentioned rightly that anointing oil and has been used in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Apostle James himself approved of its use. So I don't think that anybody will stand in the way and say that the use of anointing oil is wrong. But you gave the answer yourself that the anointing oil has been so much abused. Now, if you look at it critically, he said to him, use the anointing oil because he was anointing himself. Yes. And after Jesus died and resurrected, the disciples never used it again because they have caught the oil. So if you use the anointing oil, it's not a sin. But some churches, like my church, have decided not to use it because without the physical oil, we can anoint it. Yeah. So we do need to understand it. But when you want oil, then there can be oil for uh, business, oil for deliverance, oil for what? Yeah. So that is why I just want to 
and for some time people tell that pastors are not spiritual. Yeah, it's included. Yeah, consultation. You see, um, we can try not to play these issues of consultation, charging people. Christianity, maybe you are freely forgiven. Freely gives. Freely are foolish. And freely should not be. Once you do that, you will make the gospel be as it is. So those consultative fees and other things, all of them should stop. You know, once you have been that, people think that you have sought the wrong way of, of operating. You must be very careful about that one. There's something someone mentioned, I don't think it's very good, but I hear that story. Bitterness, unforgiveness, and some of these things can manifest like demons. Yes, they, some of these things can really, really manifest. So as a Christian, try to put Christian principles into practice. Uh, and then, you know, not all those manifestations we see are spiritual. Not all those manifestations. Some of them are psychological. Very psychological. Let me tell you this thing that happened. I was fasting and praying uh, in a special guest center. Then um, the center manager approached me one time and said that, Pastor, we have a challenge. You know, you have never disturbed me ever since we started coming here for hiding and praying. But this one is about it, so please help us. And I said, what is the issue? He said, there is this young girl who is possessed with demons, several of them. We prayed and fasted and prayed, and nothing happens. So help us. And then I allowed the girl to come. Fortunately, there was another pastor who was also around. I invited the pastor to join me because he was a teenager for about 18, 20 years. And then um, I invited the girl. I didn't allow the parents. He came with the mother and other people. I asked them to leave. And then I started that the girl should tell me the story. She started telling me the story. And I realized that it wasn't demon possession. Mm -hmm. It was psychological. Mm -hmm. But they have told me that she could not mention the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, when I interviewed her, started talking with her, she said that she was possessing demons. She came with a demon. The demon had children. So the, the demon and the children were all standing at the gate. <laughs> she had told the people so. But when I press her, I realized that they have been watching with the family the junior films. And then these stories have gotten into their mind. Then beside that, uh, uh, a family friend had raped her. And uh, the issue had gone to the police. But when I press her, I realized that she thought that she contributed to the whole thing. It wasn't the fault of completely the fault of that man. Because the man had already told her that he would break her virginity. And she contributed with the man, they went to a place and that thing happened. So when the man was raped, uh, when the man was arrested, she was worried. And she thought that if she did not forgive the man, she was going to suffer. So all of those things were going through her mind. And that one came through a film that she had uh, watch when somebody had not forgiven another, and eventually the, the, the head of that person was cut. So after all these things, I tried to dialogue with her, explain things to her, and I told her that it wasn't demon possession. She said, no, 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 I am obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> now, I want you to mention the name of Jesus. I will pray for you, because you are not possessed. And you can mention the name of Jesus. I said, no, 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 I can't. I said, yes, uh, you can't. Then I went back, explained why the unforgiving spirit came, that if she doesn't forgive, she was going to suffer, and then why she had to get those demons following her because of the films that she had uh, watched. It's a long story that I've captured. Then she became quiet. And I said, now say Jesus. She said, Jesus. And I said, tell Jesus, I love you. She said, I love you. And I said, all right, Jesus loves you, so 
He has forgiven you all the sins that you've committed. So said Jesus, forgive me all the sins. He said, she repeated, I love you. I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. And now her face changed everything was okay. Amen. I invited the village, including the mother. I told her that she's not free. It was not demon possession. I don't want you to send her to any earth uh, office, deliverer, pastor, or prophet who will say that you will deliver the girl. Now the girl is free. Look at her. She can mention the name of Jesus. As I say, Jesus, it says Jesus. And then I prayed for them. And the girl completed her education and started ATU trying to help such people. So if you are not careful, such things can come out and give up the church. But as they are not. May the Lord help us. Thank you very much for attending this one. I shall be done by praying. We are giving you assessment for